you have your Bibles this morning, you turn to John chapter 20. Each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, hold the account of the resurrection. Each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what makes them a Gospel. We're going to go to John this morning, and I want to draw our attention uh, to a few key points in the resurrection account, resurrection story. Listen, I'm glad you're here this morning. Thank you to those who are visiting, those who attend regularly. Everyone's welcome here. I'm sure glad you took some time to come to church on Easter. And you look so nice today. There's so many wonderful colors that I get to see, and you're stuck looking at me. I'm sorry for that, but I'm glad you're here. And I think what a, what a great day today is. It's not snowing. It's Michigan. Michigan, we could have been shoveling this morning. You know, you know, like I know. And as far as I know, no one had a flat tire on the way to church. I saw no huge disruptions. The fire alarm has not gone off yet in the auditorium. That can happen as well. A lot of things can happen when you come to church. You know that, right? Strange things have happened. Isn't it interesting that often circumstances dictate our response? You're running behind, and when you're running behind, every vehicle is going slow. You're driving down the road, get out the way. I'm coming. Who is this grandma in front of me? Oh, it's Pastor Ryan. <laughs> it's funny how circumstances and surroundings dictate our response. You're only going to have a flat tire when you're in an emergency situation. That's what it feels like, isn't it? You're only going to run out of money when you have a big bill coming. It's interesting how circumstances and surroundings often and usually dictate our response. And this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to look at how the circumstances and surroundings dictated a response to the followers of Jesus Christ. My friends, I'm here to tell you, though, those things though they affect us, cannot be allowed to dictate my response or your response. There will always be trouble in life. I wish I could stand up here and promise you that life would be smooth sailing, but if I said that, I'd be a liar. There are going to be times when your car is going to break down. There's going to be times when the bills, that the inflow does not match the outflow. There's going to be times when the diagnosis from the doctor comes back, and it's not what you want to hear. There's going to be times when you face problems and tragedies in life, not by your own choice, but one that will swallow you up. And my friends, as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot allow circumstances and surroundings to dictate our response. Let's look now in John chapter 20, and we're going to read the first 18 verses in the scripture this morning. Beginning in verse number 1 of John chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and when he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see it two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. 
Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and go to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Would you bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer to begin this part of our service. Lord, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Lord, that singular event has changed the destiny of every single human. And Lord, I pray this morning that as we look at the resurrection and some of the events surrounding it, that our hearts would be challenged. Lord, that you'd make the scripture to be plain to those listening this morning. Lord, help me as I speak to to utter things that would be true to your word and your truth. And Lord, I pray for a few specific things. Lord, I pray that if there is someone here whether present in the auditorium or online, who has never trusted you as a Savior and asked for repentance of their sins, Lord, I pray that today that you would help them by faith to believe in you. Lord, then I pray that our hearts would be encouraged, that even when our circumstances and surroundings look grim and dark, that we would remember to look for you. Lord, bless this time. I ask for your help. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I am thrilled to preach on the resurrection. On Facebook Live, I shared a few thoughts this morning. But every time I read the resurrection account, whether in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, there are aspects, there are parts of the resurrection story that always just like tickle me on the inside. I mean, they make me laugh on the inside. I see the the beauty of God, and I see the humor of the Lord and the power of God all in the resurrection. I I see the power in the fact that the religious leaders and the Romans were so concerned that someone would steal Jesus that they rolled a huge stone and posted guards. And when the women showed up, the stone is moved and the guards are basically passed out in the ground. This is what the Lord does. He says, you can't bind me. You can't stop me. Your greatest strength will be passed out on the ground. The biggest stone you can think to move in front of the door, I'll simply nudge it aside and I'll sit on it. This is the power of God. I mentioned this morning, but I love the fact that when the the women come and, and the angels, and often the angels say this in Scripture, often the angels lead off when they talk to humans by saying, fear not. And this, every time I read this, makes me laugh. Because if you or I encountered an angelic being on the way home that was glowing like lightning, and this angelic being said to me or to you, don't be afraid. Listen, I've read too many books. I've watched too many movies. I'm running. (laughs) Don't be afraid. I don't trust you. Don't be afraid. Every bad guy in the world says don't be afraid. Yet the, the, the angels with sincerity and truth And honestly, say, listen, fear not. Then they mention to the women just what they've been talking about a few moments earlier. Listen, if I wasn't afraid before, if you tell me what I was talking about when you weren't around and tell me not to be afraid, I'm more afraid. Yet we see the power of God in the resurrection. But I want to point out a couple of things this morning, if I can. Because my friends, my friends, these days leading up to Sunday were dark days. The followers of Jesus Christ, I would submit, had the darkest moments of their lives. They had been for three years following Jesus Christ. They had observed Jesus Christ casting out demonic beings. They had watched him as he, by miracle, healed those who were deaf, those who were blind, those who couldn't speak were mute, those who were paralyzed. Everyone who Jesus touched came away changed to to the positive. Anyone who came for healing was healed, it appears. 
And even if they couldn't get, them to get there themselves, if their friends brought them to Jesus, Jesus healed them. And sometimes Jesus healed people when he didn't even show up. Lord, you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word. It'll be so. Jesus spoke the word, and there's healing that's happening. I mean, everywhere. And the followers of Jesus have seen this for three years. John tells us that if all the works were written down, that the books and the pen and the scrolls of the earth could not contain them. So they had seen Jesus work over and over and over again. And then Jesus is betrayed. His disciples flee. Jesus is then taken to a mockery of a trial. Couldn't even prove anything against him until Jesus condemned himself, convicted himself by his own words. And then the crowd gets to vote. Do you want me to release Jesus, who has healed, who has done good, who has fed tens of thousands of you? Or do you want me to release this known convict, this nefarious individual by the name of Barabbas, and to hear the multitude cry for the release of Barabbas. It was dark days for the disciples and the followers of Jesus Christ. How can you forget about Peter who was warming his hands by the fire? Jesus just a little ways away. Probably not close enough to hear, but obviously we know from Scripture close enough to see. The young girl comes and says to Peter, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter says, no, I, I don't know this man. And she comes back again the second time. No, I know you are. You're, you're one of the disciples. And he says, no, I'm not. And again, she says, you are. And he, and he swears. He swears, I don't know this man. And right then, Jesus Christ looks with, those, with that piercing gaze right at Peter. And Peter, in despair and discouragement, turns, realizing he has denied his Lord. Then to see their, their master, their savior, beaten, crown of thorns placed on his head and taken to a cross, hung on the cross for you and for me. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thirst. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then the powerful phrase, it is finished soldiers realized Jesus was dead did not break his legs in fact the Bible prophesied that no bone of Jesus Christ would be broken in this process the scripture was fulfilled like it's always fulfilled they pierced the side of Jesus Christ and out came blood and water just like scripture said it would they didn't kill Jesus. Jesus laid down his life. Jesus on the cross was close enough to John the disciple and to his mother. In fact, he says to, to John, behold thy mother, behold thy son, basically saying to John, take care of my mom for me. Can you imagine Mary? Imagine as she watched Jesus on the cross at this point, I don't believe fully understanding, but knowing some things, and maybe dialing back 33 or 34 years at this point when the angel came to Mary and said to Mary, fear not. <laughs> so Mary didn't fear any longer and said, what will come from you will be of the Holy Ghost. And I imagine as she watched Jesus on the cross, all those thoughts came back, perhaps the memories as a mom with young baby Jesus, maybe at 12 when she couldn't find him and Joseph and they were worried about him. It was a dark day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. A dark day. Sunday morning shows up and it's still dark. It's dark physically. The sun was just coming up, but it was dark emotionally. It was dark in their hearts. They came to mourn and to weep. You see, sometimes it seems our circumstances are overwhelming. Sometimes it seems that what we are facing is too great for us to bear. And when these ladies 
Mary Magdalene and Mary came, they felt that the circumstances were overwhelming. What were they facing? They faced the fact that Jesus was dead. Their master was gone. But beyond that, someone stole Jesus. This is a problem. Not only had they killed him, now they stole his body? What would your mind go? Where would it go? You see, there's times that our circumstances seem overwhelming, that the health diagnosis is terminal, the foreclosure is imminent, the answer is negative, the relationship is unsalvageable, and the problem is unsolvable. There are times that our circumstances seem overwhelming. And here, these disciples, Peter and John and Mary and Mary are here, the followers of Jesus. I want to look at their response. Because I think their response will help us not make the same mistake. They come to the tomb, the Bible says. And when, uh, when Mary shows up, she says they have taken, look at verse number two, right before verse number three, verse number two, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. You see that in scripture? Now she said this because that's the only thing that she could make sense, that she could reasonably, logically conclude is what happened. Now did that happen or not? Had they taken the body of Jesus? Yes or no, help me here. No, of course they hadn't. What happened? Jesus had risen. But the only thing that made sense to her was that somebody had stolen Jesus. You see, what happens, what happens when our circumstances seem overwhelming, often we respond typically, or I'll say it this way, we typically respond typically. You with me so far? If you have a flat tire, what's a typical response? Happy or sad? Glad or mad? Are you like, praise the Lord, I was hoping for a flat tire. I haven't had one for like five years. I've been missing the opportunity to change a tire on my vehicle. I was just wondering if my spare was full. I'm sure it is. I remember how to get the jack out of the back of my car. I know I do, and I'm sure all the pieces are. Is that what you think? No, we typically respond typically. Are you kidding me? A flat tire. And even sometimes we go spiritually, we say, Lord, why'd you allow me to have this flat tire? Like God was waiting, aha, I'm gonna get my follower right there. Back left tire, ping. We typically respond typically. You see, she jumped to conclusions, hasty thoughts. Past this, we, we find out, look in verse number 10, then the disciples went away again into their own home, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. Understand at this point that they had seen that the tomb was empty. They had interacted with angelic beings. Yet where were their minds? They're still jumping to conclusions, in despair. Life is over. This is done there is nothing good that can happen from this situation. Do you see it? Because when circumstances seem overwhelming, we typically respond, help me, typically. But my friends, these weren't just ordinary people. These were followers of Jesus Christ. These are those who had listened to Jesus Christ. They had heard Jesus Christ. They had dwelt, they had lived with him. Some of them had. They had walked with him. They had served with him. They had ministered with him. Yet at this moment... At this moment, they're responding typically. And too often I find that our response is a typical response. We see the negative answer and our despair sets in. We see the hard circumstances and we're overwhelmed. We don't see the light of day. We don't see a good solution. We don't see an answer. But this morning, I don't want you, I don't want you to miss this fact that a change of perspective changes everything. 
Now let's look at the scripture and we're going to see what happened again with Mary. And then I think it will help us this morning. Verse number 13. And they say unto her, they as the angels say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? So the angels now have asked Mary, Mary, why are you crying? Now this is a legitimate question. The angels know that Jesus has risen. The angels have said, listen, he's not here. Okay, and so then they say to Mary, Mary, why are you crying? Or basically, why are you still crying? And she's like, they've taken away my Lord. Look in verse 15. She turns around and Jesus is standing there. Now, she doesn't know it's Jesus, but Jesus is standing there. And she supposes him to be the gardener. He asks the same question, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she says again, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. You can see the despair. You can see the conclusions. Listen, just tell me where he is. In verse number 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. In our scripture, we have just that one word, Mary. Mary. And one day we're going to find out exactly how Jesus uttered her name. Because in that moment, in that little word, a flood of emotions filled this lady. Lady who the Bible tells us had seven demons cast out of her. Huge forgiveness. A lady who had anointed the feet of Jesus Christ with her hair. This is that Mary. And he utters her name, Mary. And when he utters her name, whatever it was, however he said it, she'd already talked to him, but she didn't recognize him. When he said Mary, whether it was the way he said it, whether it was her spiritual eyes being opened, at that moment, she saw clearly. Her perspective changed. She she saw Jesus for who he is. And then he says this. She goes, Rabbi, Rabboni, our master, And he says, touch me not. I can picture what happened right there. She got up off the ground. And she was leaping to embrace the Savior. Leaping to wrap her arms around the Savior. Twice she is asked. Twice she answers. From a simple gardener to a Savior. You see, a perspective changes everything. And this morning, you and I may need a perspective change. You and I may need a change of our perspective. There's a book that talked about the resurrection. The resurrection, there were two essential requirements when they tried to prove the resurrection. One, has anyone cheated death and proved it? And two, is it available to me? They found that Confucius' tomb was occupied. Buddha's tomb was occupied. Muhammad's tomb was occupied, but Jesus' tomb was empty. See, perspective changes everything. Airline pilot was flying over the southeastern United States. For whatever reason, this airline pilot radioed the control a a control tower, local tower, and said, "We're passing over thirty-five thousand feet. Would you please give us a time check?" The tower said, which airline are you with? The pilot responded, why does it matter? What difference does it make? I just want the time. And the tower responded, oh, it makes a whole heap of difference. If you're with Delta Airlines, the time is 1,600 hours. If you're with United or American Airlines, it's 4 o'clock. If you're with Spirit Airlines, the little hands on the... And if you're with Southwest, it's Thursday. Perspective. Perspective change makes a difference. You see, what Jesus came to accomplish, he accomplished. He said he was going to die and he'd rise again the third day, and he did just that. Perspective changed. He died on the cross, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again the third day. Perspective change. What Jesus came to accomplish, he did. His death wasn't the end, but his death was the beginning. The only one who has the answer to death is the only one who has defeated death. This is why Easter is a big deal. His touch wasn't finished. His touch was merely beginning. 
See, Mary thought life was over, but with this perspective change, she found out that life had just begun. His love wasn't gone, but magnified. Mary runs back to the disciples, and she tells him she has seen the master. And they say, no, you haven't. So Jesus Christ appears unto them eventually, to the 11 disciples. And the Bible says he upbraids them, or he gets after them for not believing. There are two people walking down the road. Jesus Christ appears and walks with them. At the end of the path, when he disappears, they realize who it was. The Bible says over 500 saw Jesus Christ. Oh, but there was a special one. His name was Thomas. You may remember that we call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas, for whatever reason, wasn't with the disciples the first time Jesus appeared. And all the disciples come back and say to Thomas, we've seen Jesus. And Thomas says, no, unless I put my hands here, here, I won't believe. A short while after that, Jesus shows up when Thomas is there. He says, Thomas, come here. A perspective change changes everything. Thomas, touch me. And Thomas says, no, 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 no. Now I believe. You see, my friends, Jesus Christ wants to touch your life. Jesus Christ wants to do something in your life. And sometimes we're just like the disciples where we say, you know what? Unless I see it, I won't believe it. But my friends, Jesus Christ is real. He's true. And what he did will change your life. You see, in our circumstances, in our surroundings, we need the touch of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ demonstrated the love of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for the sins of the world. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The death of Jesus Christ showed the love of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he is the son of God. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he died on the cross to forgive sins and that he rose again the third day. To believe in Jesus is to believe that if I ask him to save me, he will. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus said, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What that means is whoever has come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins has received it. No matter how bad you are or how late the hour is. You say, I've lived a whole life apart from God. Why would God save me now? Tell that to the thief on the cross who at the end of his life, who was dying for crimes he had committed. Ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. No one who has come to Jesus has ever been turned away. And the death of Jesus Christ shows the love of Jesus Christ. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows the power of Jesus Christ. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, you don't know how much power I need in my life. You don't know what I struggle with. You don't know the mental struggles that I have. You don't know the physical struggles that I have. You don't know the problems that I'm facing with, the bondage that I feel. And you're right, my friend, I may not know that, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ reveals the power of Jesus Christ. And if he can break the bondage of death, there is nothing that can withstand his power. You may today need a perspective change. Life may seem dark. Life may seem grim. Life may seem overwhelming. And you have been responding typically. 
But a change of perspective changes everything. There were two students sitting in a coffee shop. One was a Christian and one was not. The one who was a Christian was talking to the other student and talking about Jesus Christ. Talking about the death of Jesus Christ. Talking about the forgiveness of sins that Jesus Christ freely offers. And talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Christian asked the fellow student what they thought about what they heard about Jesus Christ. And the other student responded, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to take it all in. But I'll tell you this. If it's true, it changes everything. My friends, I can promise you on the authority of the Scripture, it is true. And because it's true, it changes everything. And Jesus Christ wants to change your life. If you've never trusted in him, he wants to offer forgiveness of sins. No matter how bad you think you've been, the love of Jesus Christ is greater. But some of you are followers of Jesus. Some of you have already put your faith in Jesus Christ. And some of you, when faced with dark circumstances, are responding typically. Just like Mary at the tomb. And it takes Jesus having the question asked a few times and uttering her name before you finally like, oh, it's the master. A change of perspective changes everything. And this morning I'm challenging us to make sure that our perspective is on Jesus Christ. That we see his power at work in our life and in our heart. That we see him even when the day seems dark. We know because of the resurrection that Jesus Christ and his power touches and changes everything.